אני מניח שאנחנו מתחילים בשתיים ועשרה. to this, the most important panel in the entire Herzliya conference, which is going to discuss freedom of press, uh, freedom of expression. Just a word uh, of opening here. I think that the, our greatest failure in the media is that we have not succeeded until today to make the public understand how it is important for their quality of life to have a freedom of the press. I would like to uh, present all the members of the panel, Dr. Tehila Schwartz Altschuler, Director of the Center of Democratic Values and Institution in Israel, and the head of the uh, Israeli Democracy Institute, and she's also the member of the board of the National Press Council. Mr. Eldad Kobelens, CEO of Khan, the Israeli Public Broadcasting Corporation. Einat Fishbein, a journalist and the founder of the hottest place in hell, a digital newspaper. She also won an award of digital media. Uh, two years ago it was awarded here, Mr. Baruch Kra, a reporter and commentator on law and justice affairs from Channel 10 News. And Dr. Dror Adar, a columnist from Israel Hayom newspaper. He asked to speak last for obvious reasons. I agreed, of course. But uh, oh, each and every speaker will have seven minutes to present their views. Following questions, I'm going to present. It doesn't, it's not obligatory, but I will present some questions. As I said, our issue is uh, free press, free journalism. Is that so? And I would like to tell you how I see things. There is the m liberal model. It's rating the freedom of press. It's of high quality. It is in a country where there is low regulation, very uh, little involvement on the side of the state, and the, prof the relationship between the journalist is professional and ethical. The bottom of the rating is a lot of influence on politicians on the private and public uh, media, very low culture of uh, communication amongst the journalists, and very marginal role of the printed media. I'll tell you what the situation is like in Israel. In the electronic media, as you can see here in the chart, all channels that are broadcasted electronically are channeled in a manner where the ministers and the prime minister, minister of communication is in control of the Israeli broad corporations, minister of security on the IDF radio, Minister of uh, Finance controls everything, and of course the Prime Minister uh, has control on top of everything. You can see that all electronic broadcasting is uh, uh, channeled th through uh, the government. Uh, her salary of the, uh, is by the Prime Minister, I think that they raised their, uh, her salary by 30%. Anyhow, you can see here unequivocally, including the new Israel broadcast, that everything goes through uh, the politicians. This regards the criteria that I showed you earlier. As far as the printed uh, media is concerned, you have the editor of Yediot Achonot newspaper who met with the Prime Minister, who uh, was willing to sacrifice freedom of expression for survival. You have two quotes from this Unbelievable discussion, the dialogue that the Prime Minister had with Moses, the editor, who sees how his printed uh, newspaper is going down the drain. So both electronically, electronic media and printed media, they are both fit of the model that I presented earlier. This of the polarized pluralist with a lot a lot of influence of politicians. Actually, the regulation uh, decides for the private ones how they're going to manage their uh, things financially. When Channel 10 wanted to prolong their uh, contract, it wasn't uh, possible because of regulation. The quality of this is going to be very high and very ethical. And of course, a marginal role for printed media. Means of uh, control. In Israel, we don't have any efficient control. 
the Israeli board of uh, press has no teeth, so to speak. Um, the only means uh, that is preferred by the public uh, and politicians are the courts as a cooling effect. Uh, we just heard that the Prime Minister won um, a lawsuit against one of uh, the journalists. We are familiar with the many uh, lawsuits of Minister Derry against others who uh, sued him. This is simply a cooling effect warning journalists that they shouldn't write things in the newspaper because they're going to be sued for a lot of money. So hardly any control, any criticism over the media. Several questions that I asked, sent the panelists. First of all, how would you rate the freedom of press in Israel in light of the criteria of uh, Halin and Mancini? Second question, can we hold free public broadcasting uh, free of political influences without any uh, payment, any uh, specific uh, toll? This is like the original sin that is going to harm uh, uh, the public uh, broadcasting in the long term, and this is one of the questions I want to discuss here. Uh, printed media, can we have freedom of speech there when one has unlimited sources and is uh, given out for free, like Israel Hayom? And I understand that uh, they have uh, losses of, of hundreds of millions of shekels. For due disclosure, I have to say when the law came about for closing Israel Hayom, I thought it was not democratic, and I didn't think this was the platform to go against this newspaper. And the last question, which is very serious, is the switching of uh, media to, uh, to becoming online, is this going to be uh, some sort of a salvage for the freedom of speech in Israel? We have uh, Walla News here, we have Ynet. They're still not regulated, although the previous government uh, asked to put content online also under regulation. These are the questions. And you can do some art out of newspapers. This is my example. And uh, the artist here is Nick Giorgio from Tucson, Arizona, the United States. And I would like to ask Dr. Tehila schwartz altschuler from the Institute of Democracy to say a few remarks in this respect. You can either come here, you can talk from there. It's up to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's nice to be here as always. Thank you for inviting me. Noam spoke about the map of the connection uh, between uh, capital and government and uh, all these uh, entities. And I could have actually talked about the fact that today the entire media market is on its knees, wall to wall, because of this map that you are describing. I think you didn't say something that I think is very significant. You didn't talk about the control of the government on digital. You said that the government does not uh, organize digital today. The fact that uh, Alovich, the businessman, is sitting today in the police investigation room, that has a lot to do with it because the internet leadership is going to have a great impact on the content in the next five years. If you look at the FCC in the United States, you see that they talk about the neutrality of the net and uh, not just question of uh, concessions and permits, etc. And I was thinking maybe to say something about this uh, double uh, demand from the prime minister, politicians, regulators, Please uh, let go, let go from the media, respect its important role in democracy. But together with that, it says to the media, why don't you make some so more self-reflection, talk about the fixations that you have. And I can tell you, although I only have five minutes, but I'm fed up talking about this. And it's so boring already to talk again and again and again about these questions and to cry out. And actually, this map of connections that was described is one that is con known all over the Western world. And its uh, products in every country are different. In other words, we can talk about public uh, broadcast in Israel, which is exactly according to the British one. Nevertheless, the products are very different. 
And that is because we're talking about uh, a very complex uh, thing which has a lot of components, ego, uh, d um, dignity, a few very professional liars. There's a political culture or the lack of constitution to protect freedom of speech. And then uh, there's a problem of quality and some people have anti-democratic basic ideas. And some people say that in the new concept we cannot control and there's a difference between imagination and reality. Some people say, oh, if the government uh, stops controlling, everything will be fine and good. It's not true because there's pressure from uh, even spouses and there's money and uh, organizational norms and all sorts of other interests out of the media uh, market and things inside and also the level of commitment to best practices. How do you do regulations? There's a, a song of one of our singers that says, what is uh, the uh, purpose of all this, uh, of this pain, he says. Something that really bothers me is the attempt to hitch a ride on the digital revolution in order to reduce the freedom of journalism, in order to enhance the control of the state of its citizens. And the three, four minutes that I have, I want to take one uh, subject and I want to call it in a, a bit a, a presumptuous um, word, but I don't, didn't find any other name. If there's anything that threats today on freedom of journalism in Israel is the process, which is the victimization, a process of victimization. Media victim, victimization means that everybody, and why I say everybody um, from both sides, present to everybody on the other side a whole heaps and all sorts of kinds and ways of uh, victimization existence. Today in the media in Israel and in everything around it, there's a Babylon Tower of survivors. They are competing. Who suffered more from the oppression, oppression and deletion from the prime minister, the politicians, the right, the left, Everybody blames the media, just the same. It's an oppression device. It's a, a alienation, deletion, and fake news, said today Ayub Kara, the minister in the radio. All these words repeat themselves in the victimization discourse. And I want to say, don't get me wrong, this uh, discourse of victimization towards the media was very welcome in the beginning. Because this attempt to give an echo, an expression in the media to the voice of the other, to draw the attention to all the people who are alienated and silenced by the media and to mark uh, those control systems and to take out the uh, media from the closet in their comfort zone to show what's happening, to get uh, uh, away from the uh, myth of objectivity and to go towards transparencies. All this was very welcome because they brought us from uh, victimization to literacy. Now they enable us to know that not what is written in the papers correct like the Bible or the uh, traffic lights. And the best uh, medication to all this is the lack of trust that the public has in the media. Now it's not 50% anymore, it's 20% the public trust in the media for less than a decade. And this shows me not just the failures of the media, but more about the fact that like in any other institute which is open to the public, all of a sudden we realize that some of it is not exactly so charming as we thought, some of it is stupid, some of it is dysfunctional. But I'd like to conclude by saying that the Israeli society, in my mind, is paying a price because of the fact that the victimization discourse is the basis in the relationship between the government and the media. And actually, they created something now they cannot control. And I think that the great danger to the freedom of journalism comes from the fact that instead of using victimization as a means to get out of this situation, to raise literacy, we have a victimization which is, finds it very comfortable to remain in the status of the victim. This is something that people uh, get political gain of. And the danger to the freedom of journalism is that everybody is a victim and nobody does anything to change it. And the main demand 
to save uh, the freedom of journalism in Israel in a real sense of the word. And perhaps here I uh, want to talk about something that the decision makers should listen to, is to replace victimization or literacy in sovereignty, instead of a victimizing uh, discourse of insult, to replace to uh, meth a tool of responsibility. And it can be decision making within the media, because we do have to change some of it. It can be promotion of competition in the, in the good level, not a fake competition. And it can be in a very sincere attitude to the advantages and disadvantage of the public us. It can think of some alternative models. And also, it can be by replacing the criticism of the media, because we all criticize. You know, the social medium is a huge place of uh, cats and uh, criticism. But to replace that in doing media, in investigative journalism, in places that create and make a framework of the reality and not just talk about it. I think that the great danger to the freedom of journalism in Israel is that victimization does not become um, literacy, and both of them do not become sovereignty. <laughs> I have many questions, but we'll uh, perhaps attend to them later. And now I'd like to turn to the most bored person in the state of Israel, Mr. Eldad Kobelens, the uh, general director of Khan, the Israel uh, Broadcasting uh, Services. And let's hear uh, some wise things from your point of view, from where you're at. Hello. I would like to discuss two points. I disagree with this map of uh, control of the government in the Israeli uh, media. As far as uh, this is concerned, Khan, the Israeli Public Broadcasting Corporation, is an exception. This could explain several things that happened in the past two years. I think that there was a real attempt to try and create a um, news body that is completely disconnected from politicians. This went to, uh, from um, deciding on the board uh, and the administrators as far as my role. I am the general director of this corporation. The mechanism for choosing it was completely apolitical. And as far as this is concerned, it's a great opportunity of coming up with something which is not going to raise the need of com always fearing its existence. I can tell you with the all integrity that all directors were elected for their uh, talents and capabilities. You can start seeing our outputs. We think that they're good. It's far away from being perfect. We have two or three years until we will manage to uh, give you a, a finished, uh, perfect product. But this mechanism definitely built, perhaps for the first time, a media body that has the ability to be free. It doesn't need a uh, rating. There's no history there or history of uh, um, ads and advertisers. And in, in light of the case that the mechanism was chosen the way it was, politicians have no uh, say whatsoever. This could bring about this complete freedom of press. Uh, in the meantime, I can tell you without mod all modesty that we are uh, maintaining it. What was the third point uh, of discussion? The uh, toll. Uh, the broadcasting fee. So my answer there would be that uh, definitely yes. Perhaps it sounds uh, too naive and romantic that it's all uh, people, but as long as in the senior positions we have people who definitely came to serve the public, and it is their mission in life. There is no relevancy for the financial uh, source. The budgeting is right now high by law, and the uh, broadcasting fee was also by law, and it could also have been altered. So I'm more optimistic in the sense of uh, the capability of uh, the broadca Broadcasting uh, Corporation to be a leader in several years' time in Israel. Thank you. I was surprised. 
Mezenat Fishbein from uh, the hottest place in hell. She's representing the journalist who switched uh, to work online, uh, biting journalism that is still not regulated. Eldad, you left me so much time and I'm going to take your minutes. Well, then I'm going to try and relate to the questions and then I'll add some remarks of my own. As for the broadcasting fee, I still think that uh, citizens of Israel should pay it and this uh, fee should finance the public broadcasting and only that. And I think that Eldad, and I want to share his optimism regarding the freedom of the broadcasting corporation, the only public uh, broadcasting we have here, it's better if Israeli public pays for uh, his work and not the Ministry of Finance. And the dependency that uh, seemingly doesn't exist will continue to exist because now it's going to go, this fee, through the vehicles fee, etc., etc. The thing to do is that the public at large will finance uh, journalism. As far as the second question is concerned, perhaps uh, you want to mention, uh, remind us of the second question, what is the state of uh, journalism? January 18, uh, about 4 a.m., large forces of police went into Um al a Bedouin village. Uh, they entered with a lot of uh, weapon, ready to evict this village. This is not the first time that they're trying to evict this Bedouin village. It's not the first time that there are collisions. But this time something else occurred. Around, the, around 6 a.m., a vehicle came from one of the hills and hit and killed uh, Officer Erez Halevi. The other policeman shot and killed the driver of that vehicle, Yaqub Abu el -Kian. So around 6, 6 a.m., we already had two dead people in this eviction around 7 a.m., the media started publishing ideas that talked about a terrorist attack um, and they defined the driver of the vehicle as a terrorist who is linked with ISIS. The hours following, uh, we heard more and more news in this regard. Uh, the idea, the link towards ISIS was uh, fortified by the fact that he had several uh, copies of Israel Ayom newspaper where ISIS was mentioned. Uh, in the evening, the officer Halevi was buried and then the, uh, the chief of staff, chief of uh, the police said that this is definitely a terrorist attack. This, this was repeated by others as well as the prime minister. We, in the hottest place in hell, woke up like all other journalists, 6 a.m. We wanted to know what's going on and we heard a story from the field, from our sources who are there, because this is not the first time we are there in this uh, Bedouin village writing about it, relating to the evictions that are going to happen. And they're telling us a completely different story. They say that if this is not a terrorist or ISIS, but a teacher from the village who tried to evict himself and was shot by the police. At the same time, I'm talking in a female uh, gender, because in Hebrew uh, it befits, and we're a very uh, feminine uh, and, f and female-oriented team of journalists. Uh, so we hear the reports, and we have to come up with a headline for our website. We don't know what to do. On the one hand, they say, this is a teacher, nothing to do with ISIS. On the other hand, all media in Israel per say that it's a fact. It's uh, ISIS-linked. It's a terrorist. So what do we do? Our thought was then that if the event is still going on, nobody can have full conclusions, far-reaching conclusions, and we're publishing uh, this uh, piece of news with the title, Two People Killed in a Violent Eviction in this Village of El Khiran. That's the only thing that we could have said at that moment, and I think that uh, as an exception of free media like uh, we are, uh, we exercised a lot of um, moderation in this case, uh, something with, that we don't usually see with free journalism online. We see more news uh, being published, and I think that the most important ones are the videos of Active Styles. It's an independent body of uh, photographers. Uh, when we go on to analyze them, in the, and later on, we see that the police uh, came with the full light, and we prove that the first shot occurred before the policeman was killed. So there is a possibility we don't have final conclusion yet. 
that the driver was shot and then uh, the car deteriorated and this is what killed the police officer. We continue to cover it, we are in the field, we uh, get to his second wife, Yaakub El Kian, we interview her, we hear his life story, how life is conducted there in the village, etc. And we're the only one, we're not the only ones, other uh, independent media get to the area. A few weeks later, we, uh, there's a, a police report which is published on Channel 20 by Kalman Libskind who says unequivocally that, I don't know if it was said there, but it was very obvious that this is not a terrorist attack of uh, driving over the police. I want to say something that is very clear. If Israel did not have independent media, the story that we would have had here until today is that it was a terrorist attack and the driver is uh, with ISIS. And I'm saying that not only following my feeling of what happened there that day, but I have an experience of dozens of years of following the media, working in the media. I come from the heart of the mainstream. I've been with, uh, would you like the whole list, uh, in all sorts of local newspapers, uh, Channel 2, Channel 10, a little bit in Channel 1, and uh, in the last eight years before I left, I was in the Idiot Achronot. For uh, dozens of years, stories such as this one were presented and nobody could have said any different. The reasons for which we managed to tell a different story is because we work differently. It is a question that uh, when I thought about it, I asked myself, how is it possible? I um, There are two, and a, I mentioned two and a half uh, media bodies. They all have 100 million uh, shekels a month. It's a lot. I don't know where the money is coming from. A very little... Uh, spread. We don't have over, uh, in a good day we get only 10,000 entries. We're not like Ynet. How come several small independent media bodies can change the whole picture? And the explanation divides into two. First of all, the manner of work. We're connected to the field before we're connected to the speakers. Uh, some would say that we are um, tending toward the other side. And I'll say, first of all, that the institutional side gets their own for a period of time in the media. And the fact that we're connected to the other side makes us uh, way more cautious. Because when a media says Yaqub al Qiyam is an ISIS terrorist, I guess it will end there. They can say it's true or not true, or how did they lie to us, or whatever. They're not going to pay any price for that. If I write that the chief of police lied that day, I will have to pay a price. And this obliges me to be way more cautious. So as I said, we are well connected to the field. We don't automatically accept the uh, general view. And we still have a question. Let's say that everything okay, several crazy people, and activists, and social, etc. How does the story uh, get itself rooted in the public, and this is where we have our power as media that is independent. First of all, we stick with the fact, otherwise we'll pay prices. And the second thing is the internet. The internet is the tool which breaks this uh, equality. It turns us from one, from several people who sit wherever, to a power which is almost like any other media, the moment we have a good story, a good journalist story, it can reach any place. And we proved it, I think, that more than one time I brought the story of Um al Khiran. But two years ago in May, in the big demonstration in the Rabin Square where a police threw grenades to, to Ethiopian crowds, the only way by which the public could have known who is Yosef Salamsa who is, is an Ethiopian uh, guy who found his death several months earlier after he was electrocuted with a Tizer gun by police. 
they could only find it in the independent media. Who are these people? What's the background for the story? Where does it come from? Where is it headed? And to continue having a follow-up of the story, even when the uh, sounds of the grenades have ended. Because when we take a story and we handle it, we handle it for a long time. And on a personal note, as someone who worked in institutionalized media, there are very few opportunities for journalists to take a story and to track it over time. One of the things we have decided when we went independently is that we are going to choose what the stories that we're choosing and we're going to talk about it for a long duration of time. Public housing, for example, we're trying to map it. I can't tell you that this is the most, the sexiest story and with so much rating in the history of the State of Israel. I don't care. I know that in, on my website, the hottest place in hell, we're going to have the map of public housing because we decided that this is the story we want to tell. And the story of the unrecognized Bedouin villages will be there before or after the so-called terrorist attack. Same goes for a whole line of other topics. The question is, okay, so great, uh, in line, uh, sorry, online, everything is uh, flowing there, but we have no financing. Who's going to pay for this good? What is your financial model? But this is not for this discussion. I think that if there are any breaks, it has to do with the financial aspect. And one more sentence, I go back to what I started with. I think that because the goal of independent media is to work for the public and not for those who uh, it is serves, whether it is uh, out of will or not, the public should uh, pay for it through a business model that we're all trying to find and uh, handle. Thank you very much. Baruch Kra Baruchi, who is the representative of Channel 10 that was about, uh, under danger of being uh, closed. You heard from uh, Einat, uh, you heard some criticism about the institutionalized media. Uh, hello. I uh, like what Einat is doing and I appreciate her work for many, many years. We uh, worked a little bit together in Haaretz and I have to disagree with something with your last uh, remarks. You call yourself independent media and I'm very happy that you call it as such, but I don't think that this definition um, differentiates you from the definition of other media because once we go into the financial model, we don't exactly know who, who is financing your work. I don't know. I guess there is some um, source of financing for the salaries. So as far as this is uh, concerned, someone, we work in the same way. Someone pays my salary and someone is paying your salary. So for the sake of example, well, you didn't expose it. The last, okay, knowing a not, the last thing I say is that she's trying to hide anything. This is not what I'm insinuating. But in principle, the idea of having a financing model where someone is paying his salaries, we don't know what is the financial model and how much this, uh, how long can this continue? It's the same thing. And let's assume that your website is very successful. Perhaps in several years' time, you'll be a Walla or Ynet website as far as the number of uh, entries is. There's nothing uh, in a sense that is different, just a word. We're an NGO. No, not making any uh, profit, and I can tell you where money is coming from, but largely speaking, this is a model that we have found. NGA for the benefit of the public, no one can draw any money from that. So I support this model, I hope it's successful, and I think that the uh, the people working there are uh, people of a real mission. I'm familiar with many of them, and of course I support it. Now I want to go back to the larger issue, which is hovering above. And this is the issue of the freedom of the press, etc. 
So I'll say a few things that might even um, be a response to what Hila said. You presented the two models, that of the electronic media, particularly the broadcasted media, and the written press. So I'll start by saying that on an interesting level, if you look, well, let's take for uh, sake of example the past 20 years, once again, if you consume uh, news uh, and media in a critical fashion, and I suppose that the audience here uh, is above average in consuming uh, media news, you would identify that these issues of a fear of uh, journalism that serves interest holders, you will find it more in the written press, which is not under regulation because seemingly it is not connected to political strings and you will find it less in the electronic media. In the electronic press, perhaps uh, regulation does have some meaning in this respect. For example, a very famous uh, example in the time I was blessed to work in two places where we had complete freedom of, fr of uh, press. One is Haaretz and the other one is Channel 10. Uh, Haaretz had to deal with the famous apology to Sheldon Edelson. This uh, came to some sort of criticism, no matter if it did help or not. Moreover, when there are some interventions, it gets to the regulator and some would say that even regulation is inclined but all in all there is some sort of a mechanism somehow these things do surface the second thing is the matter of dna is how the media develops what sort of a tradition is created and in this respect i think that tradition a tradition of uh, journalism is highly influential. Now, foreign influences, foreign influences over uh, free journalism, something that we're familiar with, something that we see, and the stories are definitely well known. And when this uh, recording, like Netanyahu and Moses, is uh, out, some are surprised, some are not so surprised. However, the main issue that we see in these events, in these cases and stories, is that people or influences are in the places where they see that they can reach because there is somebody who is behaving like that, who is conducting these dialogues, who is feeling uh, good in conducting these dialogues, I can uh, perhaps uh, already say that this was very typical at the Olmert Prime Minister. This was very strong. I saw it at the Olmert trial that I um, surveyed how during the trial itself, Olmert is trying to affect and sometimes succeeds from within the courtroom on headlines on, in Ynet, for example, or other places. So this happened in real time with very strong links of uh, impact. Chaim Ramon, the very famous uh, story where all media supported him. Uh, I hope that at least in Channel 10 he did not get any support and it was not obvious there because some probably thought differently. When I uh, was covering this story, it was very clear and very different than other uh, colleagues in the media. And I go back. Why do I go back so much? Because when Netanyahu, Netanyahu has been uh, in office for a long time, people forget, people forget a very simple uh, fact. Netanyahu has been in office for a long time. The role of the media is to... Uh, criticize the government, criticize those in rule. So I guess some journalists forget, I'm not talking about those who don't do 
at their work, who are negligent, uh, who are inclined, who have interests, who are connected to the um, people in office, but those who deal with criticizing the government aggressively. I can show you that even those journalists who say that they have some sort of a vendetta against Netanyahu, if you go and look the manner by which they covered the story of Olmert, if you look for the way who are those journalists who exposed these stories, who exposed this new information, and these are journalists whose DNA is, whether it's independent or not, they go and they expose and they bring info. I'm now telling you that there are no uh, attempts to influence. Yes, there are. The question is what's happening when there are such attempts and what would be the reaction versus some foreign influences? How do the journalists react? And their reaction in the story of Edelson was one that really, really encouraged me. I came uh, out of the story and I was very happy because I saw how, what was our reaction towards things that came to the issue of our uh, shareholders. And I don't know how to give it in an exact fashion how this was created, but we have a DNA of a media which doesn't exist in most written press, because we knew that in most written press, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Things that are happening da out there in dark rooms, things that we don't know about, versus things that the moment they are surfing, they'll be immediately discussed, because a journalist, it's true, they have to earn a living, they are under these influences, and ultimately they have to uh, put food on the table. The question is how do we handle it as an organization, as a media body? There were some positive things that happened, but ultimately it's the journalist, their conscious, and the backup that they get from his uh, colleagues this would set the freedom of press that we're talking about. Uh, last but not least is Dr. Dror Eider from Israel Ayom. He asked to speak from the podium to be the last speaker. I have uh, summarized the important uh, things that you have said and I am not going to have enough time it's the first time I'm at the Herzliya conference. I'm a person from the academy. I prepared a serious uh, presentation. I told that all night, so excuse me. At least you're going to come out of here with some uh, ideas. If time allows, later on, I'm uh, willing to address your questions. Since I was offered to participate in the session, I was a uh, taken by this uh, title, Freedom of the Priests, is that so? I thought about it a lot. And just like any title, this is the tip of the iceberg of a whole network of terms, or if we take it from, uh, this is some sort of a marker which hides behind it many, many other objects. Through my uh, career, my academic career, my journalist uh, career, I see that I'm uh, trying to fine tune and to understand those terms and taking them out of the masks that we have covered with all sorts of, uh, for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes uh, this was a matter of ease, sometimes it was uh, convenient to protect ourselves. In recent years, we see the development of the discipline of communication sciences because of the false glory. This has gained more uh, area than all other, uh, than other areas like humanities and like uh, social studies. So I don't agree with those departments of communications. Perhaps they give people skills, but they don't uh, issue graduates that have a broad knowledge 
And this is what is necessary in the media bodies right now. It was once obvious that a journalist would need broad education. Today, less so. And so I recommend those who want to go into the media to study a, a field that will build their entire personality, philosophy, international relations, and all such things. The academic discipline, discipline of communications brought the reinforcement of purism of this uh, profession. In recent decades, decades, academy shifted from its uh, search of the truth, from the goal, from the idea, veritas. So the academy switched from searching the truth to looking for um, social justice or others that are dictated according to the measures of the various factors in the faculties. Alongside the important criticism over communications, there is an orthodoxy, a doxa, which is the truth, which are, is religiously maintained. The academic supervision of communication drove all sorts of to do and not to do. So such, in the beginning of the 20th century, the Jewish philosopher Edmund Husserl said that in order to understand the phenomenon, any phenomenon we should understand, we have to put on the side or to uh, wait with our prejudice and allow the phenomenon to deliver itself, to expose itself. This is the phenomenological theory that he developed. Fifty years later, we heard in Truth and Method that this thought that we can get rid of this uh, prejudice is itself a prejudice. The thought that we can disconnect a discipline, media in this case, whose essence is the communication between people, various uh, topics, to disconnect it from involvement in the fields of covering this thought has to do with the unrealistic purism. I'm familiar with this artificial game of those journalists as if they're only journalists and they're not involved in any of the political game. But for that, it's enough to have a student first year in the literature department to take the text that are uh, transmitted, that are written, and he, they can elicit very easily the political uh, views of this journalist. It's very easy to do. How does it affect the manner by which they would choose their subjects of stories and the way they cover stories? Because one should know the communication is a political, active story, not in the sense of political parties, but in the broader sense. It creates the way we look at the reality. It sets um, priorities. It lifts people and lowers people in accordance to their news in the uh, discourse. But things are not stopped in the political arena, this uh, practical. They will go way beyond. It was the Jewish philosopher Ernst Kassirer who maintained in the middle of the 20th century in his special mass, he says that the, a human's advantage is by being almost symbolicus. He says the person, the human being, does not live in nature, but rather in a world of symbols that is made up of myths, of language, of religion, these are the threads, the various threads that are weaving this complex network. Instead of dealing with things, Lacan, Lacan, the, the human being is always in monologue. It has enveloped itself in all sorts of symbols and ceremonies so that they cannot know anything anymore when it's not through one of these artificial mediators. There are several arenas that create these symbols without which we are blind. 
there are several such arenas like the scientific arena, the artistic, the religious, but the media trans transcends them all. This is shaping the awareness of the modern person. It is particularly an arena for creating mediating symbols. Herbert Marshall McLuhan, the researchers, show in real time how modern media turns into being a medium for transferring mythoses. They are not always very deep. They're not always uh, set uh, for a duration of time in our awareness. Most of the time, there are com completely taken out of the metaphysical weight. I'll end. Five more minutes. Well, you ask for ten minutes, so you have two more minutes. You have two minutes. The media creates not just our opinion, but our awareness as well. And that's why the conclusion of all this, uh, the war for the control on uh, the media, which is uh, not bloody but inky, is so strong. Because if you control the media, you control the main uh, enterprise that creates the symbols and creates the human awareness. Therefore, I think it's an existential importance of the level of freedom of the journalism that you have to put between it and any artificial intervention. It has to do with uh, the government not uh, be being able to control the media, but that's not enough. I don't see, for example, any difference between a government intervention in the media, which I find uh, unnecessary, and uh, its intervention with a private kind of a newspaper or any anything that uh, has to do with uh, the public. What songs we're going to listen to, what music, etc., etc. Because we have to know that uh, public broadcast is an anomaly, has nothing to do with freedom of journalism. From all the cultural arena, we decided that the state should give television and radio to the masses. And why? Where did it come from? Why people who are responsible about uh, any station, what do they know that we don't know? Things have to do with the differences in the social economic perception. If uh, you talk about the government being uh, involved with everything that the civil society does, then there's no free enterprise, no free initiative. The uh, traditional approach is afraid of the uh, intellectual property and the initiation of uh, people and tries to reduce uh, the involvement of a government. But let people do things do business and don't intervene. Same thing has to do with culture. Allow the people to determine themselves what they should view and what no. Uh, we also don't tell them what to read, not which movie to watch, etc. And we're not talking about the waste of the monies, of the budget that the public transportation uh, broadcasting brings. And I must say that there are some uh, hidden messages because in this way, a uh, social minority intellectual can influence the public also politically. So the equation has to be exactly opposite. I'm sorry, I'm not polite, but I think you know, you're very educated and all that, but there's some people here, and the fact that you prepared and we are just talking, you know, uh, off the cuff. Still, you have to respect the fact that people came, they came, and you're not the only one here. So I'm going to be less polite, so please, I mean, with all due respect, I understand that uh, you talk about discrimination, but nobody gave you the right to speak three times more than other people. Why three times? More times, somebody said. Okay, I'm concluding, he says. Let me just conclude uh, this uh, section. The equation has to be opposite. Uh, I could have finished by the time you were talking. The equation has to be exactly the opposite, because free journalism is determined according to need of its consumers. Apart from the market demands, a person can decide himself what to view, what to see, without any government intervention. This is the way human culture has been led throughout history, and it got to very high achievements. Thank you. Thank you, Dro. Uh,
you said something about uh, media studies. You actually spoke about the vision of our school because we think that uh, uh, education is uh, the ABC of uh, communication. We talk about philosophy and culture and everything and the literature, whatever you talk here, we tell the, the journalists in all uh, sectors, you know, be, these are very high quality people. You spoke in generalization about communication studies and media studies, but I can tell you that this is a multidisciplinary thing. So I uh, propose to you to come and listen to some of our lessons and may be pleasantly surprised. And now I'd like to, to give the floor. We still have only 10 minutes, so please. What, 10 minutes I have for me? I actually will start with the end. Since Dror uh, introduced himself as uh, the only one who is an academic and the only one who prepared something to say, well, that's the way uh, it sounded. I was listening very carefully. I didn't say you were not an academic person. I didn't. Okay, let's try to. Let's try to speak to the point. Okay, guys. Let me just say two words. Okay. Now I want to say something. No one is going to disturb me. We're all very cultured. I'd like to say two things. First of all, regarding uh, the uh, communication studies in the universities, I think that you uh, exaggerate uh, about the power of the academe to impact uh, the regular things. I wasn't uh, studying that at all. I'm a legalist, but I can tell you that what you just said may be about uh, a few lessons is being studied in their first year on communications in any academic institute and not just in the IDC. And another thing, this attempt uh, to give uh, an expression in the public discourse to other um, bodies uh, and with the control, and you're doing very well when you write uh, academic uh, and communicative things. It's very important. But let's leave for a second the academe, and let me say something in popular language. Being there, done that, bought the t-shirts. That's what my kids say. Okay, we got you. So what do we do next? And that's the thing that I think is really lacking, and that is the threat on the freedom of journalism. Because the, when we are busy all the time in uh, dismantling and uh, exposing the controllers, and this deconstruction and postmodernism, which actually in a, in a way is what you're trying to say, but we are not even thinking, what do we do next? And it's very pleasant to be in this place of postmodernism. You can look at um, all the faculties of social sciences. It's very nice to sit in your comfort zone. The question is, what next? And I think this is the question we need an answer for. Now, when I have to give an answer, to this question, let me say the following. You cannot ignore business uh, models and uh, communication economy. That is freedom of journalism. Money, money determines the borders. That's from slander to the question, who is going to replace the hottest place in hell, as was said here before? Competition is that competitors who are um, non-profit organization, and what happens in advertisement, a lot of economic issues that you cannot ignore, and that's why, um, yes, I said, on the one hand, it's libel suits, and on the other hand, it's the others, and I think that at the end of the day, if I have to go back to what was said here, the political culture, which is a culture of victimization and not of creation, is the basis to our capability to remedy the things. It's true that organizational culture in the media is something very important, but the media also are being jeopardized by external pressures. And this thing, I think, we have to take into account. Dixie. Well, I'd like to say this. Well, there are many things that we could say uh, but there. We have very short period of time. We have talked uh, 
about how the uh, media conglomerate has been created. All the media is going to be created. So I'm going to say this. During uh, Operation uh, Defensive Shield, I believe that was Defensive Shield, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I believe uh, Netanyahu said that he had uh, missed out on these things because of the operation. There was a press conference with a minister, Netanyahu, and, Le and the minister Lapid, and they had said that the Israel Broadcasting, New Public Broadcasting Corporation is about to be launched and canceling the television fees and uh, this received the blessing of the Prime Minister. And you know, we all know the history of what happened in house, so I don't want to repeat that. You will know that very well. But the thing is that if, the, if everything were so organized and academic uh, among decision makers, like you described, things. But though, you know, that is not really the case. Everything has to do with a war of elites. At best, this is at best, because this is a war of elites. And in the worst situation, in the less successful chance, we're talking about small things, about personal things. Kidon Sao belongs to what elite law? And why is the, uh, co why did the corporation annoy uh, Netanyahu so much in the selection of uh, Geula Evan, because she uh, reflects the uh, opinions of the uh, left wing, or because she's the wife of Gidon Sal, who is his rival. So the fact that you associate things with something that I wish it were so highfalutin as you uh, suggested, because then I would have been able to argue with you, I would have been able to tell you when this elite war breaks out and what happens to it and so on and so forth, I would be able to, to refer... Uh, uh, from in a very distinguished way to the to the claim to you, I, I always uh, refer in a very uh, distinguished way. But to the uh, claim itself, you know, we're talking about a war of elites without, we don't even understand about. This relates to what Hila said initially, because the media made a mistake in the way that wasn't aware of certain things, and I accept that. But it's, we're not there. We're in a different place, small place, low place base even, petty and political, with the distinctions between right and left are so fictitious, they're so unreal between this elite or the other. And you, as a person who's really educated and cultured, and we didn't need the, to, to see the show that you gave us here, because we all know that you're a cultured and educated person, you know how right I am. Okay, we're we supposed to finish now. No, I'm afraid not. The session's over. I think that we all understood what you wanted to say and what the answers are. I would like to thank all our panelists. And this was a good demonstration of the freedom of speech which you all have uh, presented. Thank you very much. <laughs>